Before I get into my talk today, which is, uh, I should subtitle my talk today, More Fun with Numbers, uh, as I think I alluded to the other day, I, I'm not a, a, a highly uh, intelligent person, so I figured my comparative advantage in life was working a little bit extra, working harder with numbers than all the smart people around me. So, um, but I think there's a lot of value in working with numbers. But before I do that, I want to talk about, uh, tell a little story about why we started the Economic Freedom Index in the first place. I didn't really get into that in the last talk, but I think it helps especially motivate why I want to talk about what I'm going to talk about today. So in the year 1984, uh, now I was in high school, so I, uh, I don't, this is a story that I'm now just telling you that I've heard. It's been passed down through the Economic Freedom Index generations, but in 1984, as you might imagine, um, none of you were alive, well, most of you weren't alive, uh, it was all the rage to talk about the book, 1984, by George Orwell. And there were many, many conferences organized, and people would talk. And the, the great debate was, was Orwell right? Um, here it is, the actual year, 1984. We have the book, 1984. And you look around the world in, in the actual year, 1984, and it didn't actually look like Orwell described. In fact, in 1984, and in fact, in 2015, at least in most countries of the world, Western Europe, the United States, Israel, the, uh, the world wasn't a totalitarian hellhole. There wasn't a big brother watching us, and, and so on and so forth, at least in most places. Um, so uh, there was a meeting uh, that Milton Friedman attended called the Mont Pelerin Society in 1984. And at that meeting, a, uh, a historian named Paul Johnson said, oh, well, um, Orwell was wrong. Uh, we, aren't, we aren't moving towards uh, totalitarian dictatorship. In fact, if anything, we're moving slightly towards more freedom. And some of the people in the room, especially the libertarians in the room, challenged that view and said, well, that might be true when it comes to political rights and civil liberties. Um, but when it comes to economic liberty, the freedom to buy, sell, import, export, hire, fire, invest, and things of that sort, the, the, the freedom to truck, barter, and exchange, to use Smith's phrase, that freedom is under increasing assault. That was the claim. And then they argued, they argued, they argued, and at the end of the afternoon, at the end of the day, Milton Friedman says, you know, the problem is we don't have a measure of economic freedom, and until we try to measure economic freedom, it's going to be very hard for us to adjudicate whether it's getting, whether we're getting more of it or less of it. And that was, that's what ultimately led to the project that I became involved in. But the original debate that got us started on the road to create an economic freedom index was trying to understand how political and economic freedom work together. How do civil liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, Freedom to assemble, freedom to petition your government for a redress of grievances, freedom to assemble, all of those so-called civil and political freedoms, how they work it together with economic freedom. All right. what, are the, what are the similarities? What are the conflicts? Now, Milton Friedman himself, when we had our early meetings related to the index, he used to admonish us that there isn't really economic freedom. There's just freedom. There's just one freedom. It's a big ball. Let's call it freedom. But then we said, yeah, but, you know, we human beings have different parts of our lives. There's a part of my life when I'm at home with my wife and daughter. There's a part of my life when I'm at work. There's a part of my life when I'm at church. There's a part of my life, and, and we have these little compartments of our lives. And we might be freer in some of those compartments and less free in others. And so it, as a matter of convenience, although freedom is maybe one holistic thing, maybe as a matter of convenience we should compartmentalize and talk about our freedoms in one dimension versus our freedoms in another. And you might be perfectly free, to, for example, to worship the God of your choice and the manner of your choice, but not free to hire a worker of your choice. So the, freedom, the freedoms that we enjoy across the various dimensions in our lives may, in fact, vary. And, and that's, again, what the index was trying to get at. But um, what we want to try to think about today, what I want to try to start thinking about, is how do these, how do these various dimensions that we exist in, how, the, how, how do the freedoms work together, or are there actually sometimes frictions between them? Um, this is actually a little bit, this, this is actually two talks. The, the advertised talk is about something called the Hayek-Friedman hypothesis. That'll be the first part. But it actually doesn't take me very long to go through that, maybe 25 minutes usually. Uh, it's a fairly simple idea. And uh, I think we'll have time to actually do another, another second talk. So this is, but they're both on the same broad theme about economic freedom and other freedoms. 
And especially the first part is going to have something to do with Israel, um, which is kind of cool since I'm actually in Israel. Um, uh, the, I should mention both of these talks are based on academic papers that I, I've done. This, the first one is based on a paper I published with Jeff Clark in this journal, Economic Behavior and Organization. Um, Jeff did no work on it, so I'm taking all the credit, but anyway. Um, all right, so big theme for the day. When someone makes a claim, someone makes a claim about how the world works, I think we should always ask, how do you know? What is the evidence for that claim? Now, sometimes the evidence for that claim may be pure logic, right? But most of us aren't going to be persuaded by pure logic. Uh, Einstein, or excuse me, uh, Newton figured out gravity. And it's a set of equations. And it's a perfectly consistent set of equations about gravity. But until you see that apple fall, right, are you going to believe those equations? Probably not. So one of the things that I try to impress upon my students is that when someone makes a claim about how the world works, always ask, how do you know? What is the evidence in support of that particular claim? So I want to I focus for the first part of this talk on a particular claim that was made by F.A. Hayek in The Road to Serfdom, and then later on, a similar claim, I think identical claim actually, made by, by Milton Friedman. Uh, so in The Road to Serfdom, uh, Hayek says, and I'll read this, if capitalism means here a competitive system based on private property, uh, it is important to realize that only within this system is democracy possible. Hayek is making a claim, and a claim about, that says only within a system of capitalism, only within a system of economic freedom is democracy possible. Wow, that's a, that's, a, that's a bold statement about how our world works. If you want democracy, then what? You have to have a system of economic freedom. That's Hayek's claim in The Road to Serfdom. Uh, 18 years later, if I have the math right, yeah, uh, Friedman uh, in Capitalism and Freedom makes, a, I think, a similar claim. I know of no example in time or place of a society that has been marked by a large measure of political freedom and then has not also used something comparable to a free market. I don't know of any place, Friedman says, I don't know of anywhere that has political freedom that doesn't have at least something comparable to a free market. Okay. Now, I want to emphasize that this claim is, is, a, is peculiar in its, in its nature. It is a sort of necessary but not sufficient kind of claim. What they're both saying is that Economic freedom, capitalism, whatever you want to call it, is a necessary condition for political freedom. It's not a sufficient condition. In other words, you might have economic freedom, but not have political freedom. But if you want political freedom, you have to have economic freedom. That is the claim that Hayek makes. That's the claim that Friedman makes. Uh, uh, in both cases, actually, I just for, for the purposes of this paper, this is several years ago, but for the purposes of this paper, I reread The Road to Serfdom and at least the relevant parts of capitalism and freedom. And I must say, I was a little bit um, displeased with the level of analytical rigor that each of them used to back up these claims. But Hayek, I think, has, has one, one particular view that Hayek advanced, I think, that makes some sense, is that, look, if you're going to have central planning, if you're going to have an economic plan that's not capitalism, that isn't freedom, economic freedom, that means you need to order the economic resources of the economy in a particular direction according to the idea, the vision of the central planners. You're going to be a ball bearing worker. You're going to be in the army. You're going to be uh, a seamstress. Sorry, that just came out. I don't know why I said that. All right. Each one of you is going to have to order your existence and all the land, all the buildings, everything is going to have to be put into the, the plan. Well, if we're going to live in that kind of economy, can we let you guys choose your leaders? Can you choose the planners? Not really. There's a conflict there. Because what if you don't want to be a seamstress? I'm presuming you don't want to be a seamstress, right? So you don't want to be that. Can we let you picket and march and demand the freedom to become a security guard? 
maybe your dream, your passion is to become a security guard. I don't know. Okay. Um, well, no, we can't. We can't. We can't let you have that freedom because that'll mess up the plan, right? So that was the idea. That was the theoretical idea. But again, I'm, I, I don't do theory because I'm not, I'm not, public schools, I'm not smart enough, okay? So I want to I, I wanna look at this empirically. Now, I want to, uh, uh, I teach in a business school, the Cox School of Business at SMU, and I think it's an unwritten law that every college of business lecture has to have at least one two-by-two two matrix. Uh, so I'm, I'm satisfying the union rules here. Um, now, the world is not 0, 1, 1, but for the purposes of exposition, let's suppose we have either a situation in which countries or societies are free or not free in these two dimensions. So this axis is politically free and then not politically free. Uh, reading, uh, so this top part is political freedom, this bottom part is, is political uh, oppression. And then on the uh, reading ver horizontally, the far to the right would be economic freedom, free market capitalism, shall we say, and this would be central planning. These are, you know, again, the real world is not zero and one. That's why we have an economic freedom index with numbers from zero to 10. It's more of a con continuum in real life, and I'll show you that in a moment. But for this, let's just think about it. Now, if you think about uh, the situation, now there's no, there's no shortage of examples you know, up here, right? Places are free, free countries both largely free economically and largely free politically. The United States, I think, is a fairly good example of that. We have something like a market economy. It's not without its rules and regulations and so on, but it's a, it's a market country. And we have a fairly high amount of, of political and civil liberties. I'm perfectly free to tell jokes about Obama or, or whoever I, I choose. Now, the same thing is true down here. There's, unfortunately, I might I suggest, there's no shortage of examples of totalitarianism in both dimensions. Uh, I put the Soviet Union as an example uh, of that, but of course, even today, you, could, you can find, find a few examples. And there's another, this quadrant over here, this would be the, the so the, the diagonal, the, the on diagonal here, this, there's nothing particularly, I think, interesting about countries that have a lot of freedom in every kind of dimension, and then there's countries that have very little freedom in every kind of dimension. That's not a very interesting thing. Uh, that just, you know, it's interesting in some ways, but it's not interesting for this. This one and this one, the two sort of off diagonal, these are the kind of weird ones. So we have this weird combination here. That's the economically free but not politically free combinations. In parentheses, I put Singapore here. Today, as you know from the other lecture, Singapore is second in the world. Uh, and yet, it's, again, it's not totalitarian, but it's not exactly the world's greatest example of a liberal democracy. And civil liberties and political freedoms are are fairly heavily circumscribed there. Um, other countries that might fit this bill might be some of the oil-rich Arab nations, such as uh, Dubai, Emirates. Uh, pretty free economies, but obviously not uh, politically free or, or have a lot of civil liberties. So there are examples down here, and uh, you could even put Hong Kong here. Hong Kong is the most economically free place, and yet they, they are not. They, they have no voting rights, uh, even today. They have no voting rights under the British. They essentially don't have that today. They have some civil liberties. You can tell jokes and you can write op-eds in Hong Kong. But again, you might put Hong Kong in this quarter, quarters here. And this was a quarter that Milton Friedman and F.A. Hayek, they didn't have anything to say about that. I mean, they weren't really commenting on that. Because remember, the, the, the statement was necessary but not sufficient. They said that this is the part that couldn't happen, right? This part up here. This is where you're trying to have not economically free. This is central planning. But, oh, we're going to let people vote and speak and worship and assemble. We're going to have all kinds of civil liberties and political liberties, but we're going to really run the economy tightly. Friedman and Hayek said that upper left quadrant should not happen. Milton Friedman was very clear. I know of no example in time or place. It's an extraordinarily strongly worded statement. Yeah. You have partial freedoms, like religious freedoms and other freedoms that may have less involved in the job market and the electoral market that can be a mesh of that? Yeah, you certainly could broaden the dimensions beyond the two. Uh, of political, and, and I'm going to fold, I'm, but for practical purposes, I'm folding everything that is in economic freedom under the label political freedom. But uh, you could certainly add dimensions to this in, in greater dimensions. As it turns out, um, as it turns out, if you look at indexes of political liberties like voting, political participation, freedom to form a political party, that kind of stuff, the like hardcore democracy type freedoms. And then you look at also civil liberties, freedom of speech, religion, whatever. Those two things are almost one-to-one -one corresponding. 
Um, actually, Hong Kong is the one exception where you got a lot of civil liberties, but you can't vote. Pretty much every other place, those two things are like identical. So there isn't, as an empirical matter, there isn't a lot of value distinguishing political freedoms from, say, civil liberties, because the two empirically are just like on top of each other. Whereas that's not true with, e with economic freedom. So that's, that, that's what I want to investigate, and I want to investigate it with numbers. Again, it's fun with numbers. Uh, so here are the numbers. Oh, what? Whoa, gosh. Okay, what is that? Um, well, let me tell you about the numbers. First of all, uh, you won't be surprised to learn that when it comes to measuring economic freedom, I'm using the Economic Freedom of the World Index. Okay. Um, and that is uh, across the horizontal uh, axis, EFW Index, Economic Freedom of the World Index. And I've standardized it so that it's, it's centered on zero. So if it's a positive number, that means you're above average. If it's a negative number, that means you're below average. It's standardized uh, mean of zero, standard deviation of one. Uh, the vertical axis is the Political Rights and Civil Liberties Index published by the, uh, by the Freedom House, this organization, long long-running organization in New York City. I think they've been coming out with Political Rights and Civil Liberties Indexes since 1972 every year. So they've been in the business of indexing lo far longer than, than I've been in the business of indexing. Uh, and they have these indexes of, of political rights and civil liberties. Now, I think their original scale is a one to seven scale, and oddly, higher numbers are bad. Anyway, it's all confusing. So I've standardized them, and I've also flipped the scale. So, so a zero here, if you're, if you're right here on this vertical axis, if you're right here in the, at zero, that means you have average political freedom and civil liberties. If you're to the north, if you're up, you've got better than average political rights and civil liberties. And, and so on. So in fact, this sort of matrix, uh, this sort of thing is exactly parallels what I've got here. Anything up here is, is, is you know, that combination and so on. So this is the combination. Now, when I first did this picture, I just, you know, worked out the math and did this picture. I went, uh-oh, wait a second now. According to Milton Friedman, we should have nothing in the upper left, right? And then I did the picture, and um, there's 815 dots here. You can count them on your own. N is the number of, number of dots. It's the number of country time periods. So I've got, it depends on the year. I got data back to 1970. This is 1970, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, and 2000 data. Actually, I think it only has, it stops at 2005. So I've got a lot of time periods and I've got a lot of countries. So there are five dots up there for the United States. And of course, the United States is always right up here. But uh, so there's five dots for every country. Now, some countries I may not have had all five years, so uh, for uh, Russia, I think I only have 95, 2000, and 2005, for example. So, so these are all, the, but the, basically this is all of the evidence I have right now about countries in different times and places where they are in economic and political freedom. Now again, at first I was worried, oh my gosh, there's a bunch of dots up on the left. Friedman and Hayek said there should be no dots in the upper left. But you got to remember, I've standardized these numbers. So by definition, by the way I constructed this picture, half the dots are roughly speaking to the left of the, of the vertical line. Half the dots are roughly speaking to the top uh, above the horizontal line. That means basically one quarter, one quarter, one quarter is, uh, you know, basically I've designed it that way. So then I, I said, well, I got to think harder. So I went back to Friedman's quote. And I'm going to use Friedman's quote. So he says, no example, no example, time or place, large measure of political freedom. Let me think about that. What does it mean to have a large measure of political freedom? Okay, large measure of political freedom. How about, I make, I'm making this up. How about one standard deviation above average? So you see there's a one right here. So everybody that's in, in above that level right there, let's say that's a lot. It's arbitrary if you want to make it 1.5 standard, or 0.5, we could argue that, but it's, it's just, so I'm going to say right now, everybody up here has got a lot of economic freedom, or a lot of political freedom. And then he uh, went back, I, the second part of the quote is, something comparable to a free market. So I got how do I operationalize something comparable to a free market? Now, something comparable is kind of weak, it's not as strong as large measure, I think. So uh, going in here, I said, well, how about if you are, if you are just above average in, in economic freedom? Okay, that would be a large measure. So are there any places that have a lot of political freedom that don't have at least some economic freedom? Well, the answer is yes. There's this group right here. They're really high on political freedom, but they're not really comparable to a free market. They're below average. 
So I found some, some countries, um, and, and actually there's 76, it's not 76 countries, it's 76 country comma years, okay? I think it's actually 32 different countries in different time periods that uh, I found violations. So I found, again, of the 815 country year data that I have, there were 248 countries with a lot of political freedom, 550 with not so much economic freedom, and the intersection there is 76 countries. So I wrote this paper and I said, Milton Friedman was wrong. Because Milton Friedman said, how many should there be? Zero. Zero. I know of no example. <laughs> he, he actually gave us a very strong, he didn't say it's unlikely, he simply said zero. So I wrote this paper and said, Milton Friedman was wrong. Oh, of course, I'm not going to write that paper, right? I mean, come on, look at me. Uh, I said, I, I got to say something nice about Milton Friedman. So I, I said, well, you know, let's look at it by year. And I did that by year. I said, you know, one of the things that's kind of cool is that if you look at it by year, in the early part of this period, like in 1980, there were quite a few of those violations, quite a large number of those violations, uh, high political freedom but not high economic freedom. A lot of them were in the 80s or 70s. But what's happening to them over time? They're dropping out. They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're dropping, they're, they're losing, the, they're getting out of that red area. So by the most recent period, I had data, I haven't updated this for the recent data, uh, by the most recent period in 2005, uh, there were only two, actually two or three countries, 2.4%, I think it's three countries, uh, at, in the sample that, that, were, um, that were problem children for Milton Friedman. So he's still wrong because there's still some examples, but one thing I was able to say, I think I'm able to say, I'm gleaning from the data here is, hmm, maybe what Milton Friedman should have said is this. Combining, economic free, or combining political freedom without economic freedom is really hard. And you can try it, but it's not sustainable in the long run. That's my rehabilitation. It's my attempt to rehabilitate Milton Friedman and F.A. Hayek. Well, then I said, you know, let's, let's take a look. And in fact, Israel is uh, one of the case studies I look at. Yeah. Just about the way you standardized uh, the table here, you did, uh, I mean, the average is for all the years, or the all average the years. for each country each year? All the years. So, I mean, in a way, you can say that if the average moved with the time, I mean, let's say that yeah. into, so yeah. you, you created it that way, you have to, I mean, the violation must happen because if the world became more economically free right. in, uh, during this time, so saying below standard is, right. well, that's not, I, I, I won't. Well, no, but the, there's, the, uh, yeah, you're right, I standardized it based on the entire period, but there was nothing guaranteed about the world we live in that we would get more economically free. Now, it happened to be that from the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s, the world got more economically free, but that wasn't ordained by God, so, so there's nothing, you know, about that that I think should upset this story. No, the average was one average for the whole period. So, so, yeah, yeah so, yeah. Um, so, I said, well, let's look at some countries. Now, the one country I could have looked at is India. India is the greatest example uh, that violates Friedman's uh, theory. I mean, India was run by, we saw the video, the movie the other night, right? It was, it was essentially a, a Soviet-like economic plan through the 60s and 70s. Uh, and yet, world's largest democracy, you can write any article you want, and there are 50,000 Indian uh, newspapers you can write an op-ed, and you can say anything you want, and they have more gods and religions than any place on, on Mother Earth. I mean, so in terms of political and civil liberties, you're not really, there's no real great limit to that in, in India. Uh, but again, the country was trying to run a central plan. That's exactly the kind of thing that Friedman says shouldn't happen. Um, but I chose, the, I chose Israel because I actually think the India story everybody knows about, but hardly anyone knows about the Israel story. And Israel's a little bit off the map because they're not quite as high as they would. But if you look at where India, Israel was, say, in the 70s, we have them very low on the economic freedom scale. Remember I said they were very low, like three or four on our 10-point scale, right? Really bad. Uh, and I think you could arguably say, in terms of central planning, it was approximating the kind of central planning that you had 
in, in, the, central, in, in the centrally planned Eastern Europe Soviet Union. And yet, of course, uh, Israel was pretty far above average on political freedoms. Um, not quite as uh, high as, as some of them, but, you know, pretty good. So they were in this upper left, pretty far in this upper left area, 70, 75, 80, uh, really, really low economic freedom. Um, 85, 90, still pretty low economic freedom. Political freedoms, though, isn't that awful. Pretty good, right? You know, democracy, competitive political parties, fair amount of free speech. I think you're getting a little bit of a, of a hit here because of the whole Arab-Palestinian thing, but, you know, it, you know, still pretty good scores. Um, but what was the problem for the Israeli economy in 1970 and 80s? It was horrible, right? Growth was low, hyperinflation. People were leaving the country. You have net out migration, right? It's a disaster. And so what happened? Well, I don't know what happened. I'm not, I don't know anything what happened here. All I know is that starting in 80, 85, 90, it's still bad in 90, then then boom, and then boom, and then boom. Where is Israel today? High economic freedom, not as high as it could be. We're arguing that all week, but high, relatively high, 39th out of 157. Where is the political freedom? You have too many parties I heard last night, right? There's too much democracy is what I keep hearing now, right? So you got good economic freedom, good political freedom. So I Israel has had this wonderful journey. It wasn't so wonderful, I think, to go through the 70s and 80s here, maybe, but they had this journey, this, this interesting journey, where you tried, the country tried to combine political democracy and political freedom and civil liberties with a very tightly run economic system. What happened? The economy was poorly performed, performed poorly, crisis, hyperinflation, and something had to give. And in Israel's case, what happened is they moved to the right economically, no, 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 no pun intended there. They moved over here to the upper right quadrant, and now you have your, your freedom environment, shall I say, is aligned. You, bo you both have high economic freedom and high, relatively high economic freedom and relatively high political freedom. And so I think, again, it's consistent with my story that this down, you can try this, you can try that, but it doesn't work really well. And eventually, something in the political system will move you off of that upper left area, okay? And I gotta be honest, I don't know anything about the particulars of how that happened, uh, about Israel. Um, and maybe I could learn from you, but that's what the data, data show. Now, there are other examples that are not as, as pleasant and don't have the good ending that we have, relatively good ending that we have in Israel. Uh, Venezuela has done almost the exact opposite thing. In 1970, uh, Venezuela had a fairly high political freedom and civil rights measure. It was a liberal democracy. They had frequent and free and fair elections. There was plenty of newspapers and television stations and op-eds, and people could tell jokes, and, you know, it was an open society. And, actually, it was the highest rated Latin American country in the Economic Freedom Index. It was the most liberal market economy in all of Latin America in 1970. Uh, and then what happened? Progressive politics took over in Venezuela, as was true in a lot of Latino countries. And they started moving to the left. They zigzagged a little bit, but you can see 70, 75, 80, 85. And pretty soon in the 90s, we, have, we are moved way towards economic planning. They nationalized the oil industry. They nationalized hotels. I mean, they were nationalizing everything. The, uh, they were raising tariff barriers to protect uh, import substitution policies, all kinds of of progressive left-wing policies took over in Venezuela, and they moved over here. Now, for a while, here it is in the 90s, certainly 1990, you can see they're still having a lot of political freedom. The, the political democracy is, is still working reasonably well. But what's happening in the Venezuelan economy as they've moved to the left? The same thing that happens every economy that moves to the left, if, you dare, if I may say. It, it, it craps out. It, it turns into disaster. Oil production falls. The import substitution policies don't work. Prices rise. Hyperinflation. And um, now, what did the Venezuelan, how did they react to their crisis? Israel reacted to its crisis by moving towards economic freedom. How did, Israel, how did Venezuela react to the economic crisis? They doubled down. Found a guy named Chavez. Chavez came to them and says, look, elect me and I'll fix everything. How did he fix everything? 
Well, he, he, he kept the economy to the left of center on economic freedom. The 2010 number is going to be down here, by the way. But what did he do? He zigzagged down to, to, to this quadrant right here, right? This is the quadrant where what? This is, this is the Soviet Union quadrant, right? I mean, it's not, the it's not as bad in Venezuela as the Soviet Union. But this is the quadrant where you have low political freedom and low economic freedom. Chavez in Venezuela is the result, not the cause of Venezuela's problems. The timing is quite clear to me that what happened is the first thing that happened is that the Venezuelan democracy chose to go to the left. That ruined the economy, slowly but surely ruined the economy. And then when that crisis evolved, they went to a, a, an even greater populist, uh, progressive populist, uh, and ultimately dictator. Um, uh, and it's even gotten worse if you look at more recent data. So again, though, this quadrant, you can try to hang out up here. You can try to be in that upper left quadrant, have that wonderful socialist economic plan, but still, oh, we can still talk and speak our minds and all that vote and stuff. You can try that, but it doesn't look like it's a sustainable situation. You're going to have to eventually match up your freedoms. Uh, hopefully, you will do it the way, hopefully it happens in most places the way it happened in Israel. But unfortunately, it, it's, I've got no particular theory that says it, will, it doesn't always go this way. It could be either one. We're flipping coins, perhaps, here. Uh, I don't know. Okay? So, yeah? Uh, you haven't shown us any country that stays within the sector. So, yeah. to me, I, I, see, I see the bouncing around. Yeah. But there actually are, if you go here and here, oh, there's all kinds. I mean, you know, the U.S. will just be like a little, little circle and... Um, China would be sort of around here. They might have moved a little bit over here, but they're still going to be down here. Uh, and actually, I've got in the paper, I don't actually have it in the presentation, in the paper I've got Singapore and Taiwan, I think. And they're like uh, here, although Taiwan went up there, but Singapore like buzzes around down here. So there are actually, if you did, mo if you did all 150 whatever countries I have data for, you would see most of them are pretty stable. The ones that are unstable are the ones that try to hang out up here. Okay. I do think there's a second paper to be written about these countries, but actually here it's a little bit more confusing. S Singapore has been like this for 40 years, <laughs> right? I mean, it's been high economic freedom and low political freedom for a long time. And I don't know how, how long long is in this game, but that's fairly long. Uh, that w we've, we've crossed through at least a couple long uh, short runs, <laughs> you know, uh, in Singapore, and they've, they've managed to get to, get to uh, and it's very stable. But we don't have any country up here that seems to hang out up here for more than a decade. Something ends up giving. Can, can you incorporate like a third dimension of economic growth into this? And if so, what um, Yeah, well, of course, a third dimension means you, it comes out of the thing and our brains really lose. So you need to go to multivariate regression and whatever. Um, there are lots of papers that look at economic growth and then look at political and, and, and economic freedom. Yeah, well, there, yeah, the, yeah, there's all ball. There are a lot of papers that do this. Uh, there's a really good paper by uh, Jerry Scully, another good paper by a guy named John Dawson, um, that try to look at sort of all three, economic freedom, political freedom, and economic growth. Um, obviously, extra dimensions explode, the, the, and you need more data. To really get quality results, uh, you need data, and the complexity problem becomes uh, much, much of a bigger, bigger issue. One of the things I like about uh, Friedman and Hayek here is that this is one of those cases where you have a very clean empirical claim. You know, there's not a lot of ambiguity when people start saying no example in time and place. Right? I can test that. A lot of claims that get made in social sciences are sufficiently vague that you can always argue any test this way or the other. That's what Peter was talking about a lot today. Here we've got clean empirical cl statements, and clean empirical statements kind of call for, I think, clean empirical investigations. Um, but I think it's important for us, the larger lesson, is to hold people accountable when they make claims. And here I'm holding two of my intellectual heroes accountable. Milton Friedman and F.A. Hayek are people that I revere as intellectuals. They're heroes of mine. And yet I still wasn't satisfied just taking them at faith, reading the books. I was satisfied for 20 years, and then I had the numbers. that said, you know what, we should look at this. We should make sure that what they had to say has some empirical validity. And in fact, I end up criticizing Hayek and Friedman for overselling that their case. Now, to be fair, they were writing long before any of these numbers were available. Uh, so, but still, I, I think it's important to hold even the people you, you like accountable when they make statements like that. Okay. 
So it's kind of fun with numbers, right? That's what, these, that's what the index is for. I'm about to transition to the second part, so maybe I should pause and take a couple questions about any of this. You guys, it's perfectly fine to do it during the talk, too. Yeah. I'm having a little bit hard time. Uh, it's hard. It's a little economics and uh, political freedom. Because I'm not sure they're not the same. As I see, political uh, rights are part of economic rights. Sorry, the other way around. Economic freedom is part of political freedom. While we do it, make it, I'm not sure it's work together because I think for beginning we have a strong definition of what is political freedom and what is economical freedom, and then we can examine if they're really the same because that's what I think. And if they're the same, I'm not sure all of this gaming, all of this theory is really well, necessary. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, you're almost saying, I think, what Milton used to say that, that maybe we should just not do this, we should just talk about freedom. Uh, but again, um, we, we put on different hats in our, our human existence. You know, we put on the hat where I'm voting. That's my voting hat. Then I take that off and I put on the hat where I'm the employer hiring a worker or the importer importing a product. And then the hat where I worship my God and then the hat where I have my children and my wife and home, my family. And in fact, my autonomy, my ability to make individual choices without interference from others is going to be Imp impacted differently in those different dimensions. So we can still measure, I think, di differentially how, when I'm wearing the one hat, how free I am to behave, and then when I wear the other hat, how free am I to behave. And in fact, the numbers kind of back up that fundamental reality when you look at places like Singapore, where it's perfectly, it's the easiest place in the world to hire, fire, import, and export, but is far from the easiest place to criticize the government. So I, 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 I have sympathy, and Milton Friedman indeed, and this is, you're in good company here, I have sympathy for this notion that we shouldn't be parsing out this, this, this fundamentally holistic concept. But the reality is, in a multidimensional world, I think we can, and I think the data show that there are, in fact, I mean, if you look at the data, um, there are, in fact, a lot of, of countries that have sort of off-diagonal experiences. Yeah, but the data is based and considered that you have two different political rights. The political right is not like economic right. And if you don't have the assumption, it's a bit different. If you don't have the assumption that you have two paths. Look, there's, there's no assumption here at all. It, it, it was entirely possible that every that these dots would, would have aligned like really nicely in a straight sort of regression line like this, and that, there were, that the two freedoms would have perfectly matched. That, that, that was not baked in or built into this picture. This picture could have been very nicely ordered and said it was like a shotgun. Less. So I don't think there's anything built into the analysis that gives me that result. I suppose the right, for example, is that Yeah. Uh, the more fundamental question, there are at the more theoretical level um, areas where uh, it's not easy to tell what political and what's political and what's economic freedom. So the military draft is one example. Uh, we have the military draft in the Economic Freedom Index because I look at it sort of as a 100% as a tax on your labor for three years, right? That doesn't mean it's a bad idea, but it's 100% it's tax on you. Uh, Milton Friedman actually, as you know, was a, a strong opponent of the military draft, but when we were debating this very topic, he actually raised Israel as an example. He says, yeah, you know, military conscription is a, a violation of your freedom, but if I was in Israel, I'd probably be in favor of it. Uh, Milton Friedman said that, and, I, and I, I heard him say that, so I know that's a true story. Um, in other words, Milton Friedman said, yeah, freedom is a good thing, but there may be other things that are good, like security, and you might trade off one good thing for another good thing. That was a, that was a reasonable thing. So we, you know, we had to debate that. Was that political or not? The one example, though, I, I have that I love is uh, uh, told to me by Michael Walker from the Fraser Institute. The question, somebody said, uh, somebody in Mexico was telling him that there's a huge tariff on ink, newspaper ink. And Milton Friedman, or excuse me, Michael Walker was confused. He says, well, well, you know, Mexico doesn't have a newspaper ink industry to protect. There is no domestic, all the newspaper ink was imported. There was no company there that was making newspaper ink. So why would you have a high tariff? There's no domestic interest group that would be in favor of it. And the Mexican looked at him and says, what's the reason? They want less newspapers. They want fewer newspapers. They want, if you bring in less newspaper ink, what does that mean? There's fewer newspapers. If there's fewer newspapers, that means there's fewer places that the government can be criticized. So it was a, so that economic freedom issue, a tariff, which is normally considered an economic freedom, actually was put in place 
for political purposes. So yeah, there is bleed over between the two, and it is in fact, you're right, I think it's, it's not, the lines between the two are, are fuzzy, shall we say. Well, I mean, I, 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 again, th these two indexes are, are, are you know, they're, they're not, again, if, they, if these things were perfectly correlated, I think, yeah, you might just say, oh, well, freedom's just freedom. But the reality is, with the data we have, we know there is a lot of, of, of variation. There are a lot of places that have got a lot of economic freedom and not a lot of political freedom, a lot of countries with the reverse. So, although, you know, that's just the reality. So, they're, they're apparently in real life, there are countries that, that try, to, try to do that weird, weird combination. Think again about the nuclear service, where you put it, where you made it, it's where you put it. So, uh, right. I put it in economic freedom. Sure. Make the difference. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Just wanted to say, I think that the, if, we, if we talk about Israel, it's a little bit more uh, complicated because uh, the hyperinflation was during the Liberal Party, uh, it was in the government. And it's actually. And it was a result of yeah, it was a gradually procedure, but the, the peak was when the Likud uh, started governing in the, in the government. So I think that uh, it's not so black and white, you know. I, I don't know what that means. So, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I realize that. The, but that the they practice. start put down all the customs and uh, they uh, make it possible to buy dollars and stuff, and it still was much more worse than when the left wing party. Right, but I'm, I'm not, there's nothing in this analysis about political parties. I mean, the fact of the matter is, every country in the world's got a left party, right party, and you can still be up here and have left wing parties. You can see down here and have, have no, libertarian parties. Liberal party and the social democratic party. Okay, but I mean, so what? I mean, Israel's situation had nothing to do with political parties, I think. I, mean, really, I don't know. All right. Okay, yes. Um, I think that what we saw right now uh, really makes me doubt the entire index of economic freedom because what what I understood was the point of this uh, data collecting was okay, I'm, I think this is the right opinion but I'm not sure so I'll take data and I look at the data and then I will have the truth and here we get an example where you get the data and it, it doesn't sit well with what you believe in and so I, I do, I, I like the fact that you say, oh, I found out they were, they were wrong, but then you came and you saved them with, oh, okay. with a very nice explanation. Oh, right. And you know, I really think that if we would give the raw data of your uh, index to Democrats, they would be able to sit and to find the way to present the data that would support their cause. So it's very, I think it shows the weakness of of this way of examining things, because data is very easily manipulated. Uh, I, 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 I'm really sorry that I, I, I really emphatically disagree with that. Uh, I, uh, I, I do, yeah, to be sure, I had, I had a very strong prior belief, as everyone does when you do research. And in fact, I significantly changed my views of the world because of that research. That, I think, is, is exactly evidence in favor of, of this kind of work. I, I see, I mean, 100% the opposite. Yeah, to be sure, uh, I didn't turn into a raving left winger. In fact, there's nothing in this that should, 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 uh, should, should, should have uh, pushed in that direction. Uh, I certainly didn't, didn't think, didn't say, oh, they're completely wrong. He said, look, they're, they're wrong. Uh, it is relatively rare, and it's apparently not stable that they were wrong. And I wrote that. I think that's perfectly, I think it actually, if you can convince me, Bob Lawson, radical libertarian, to write a paper that says Milton Friedman and Friedman F.A. Hayek were wrong, that shows to me the power of the empirical data. So, I don't know. Yes? Uh, do you remember the data about the Scandinavian countries or Norwegia, stuff like that? Because I, I have an idea, I mean, for what I remember, or yeah. what, what comes to mind, that the kibbutzim, can be an interesting example to to this because they had a central planned economy. Yeah. It's in a much smaller scale. Yeah, but and, and they still chose their own leadership inside. I mean, the guy who gave the choice was chosen democratically. Yeah. So in a way, it's interesting. And you can say they weren't stable because now we don't have these many of them. Uh -huh. But who? It's interesting that the ones that did survive are the very rich ones. Well, I mean, they, if they you have, have enough freedom, to give around, it's yeah. possible to have a centralized economy and political freedom. 
So that's why I'm asking, I think about Norwegian because it's maybe the best example of a country who has a lot to give around just because they do. And it's interesting because they're going kind of in that direction. I mean, they have, you know, that don't have a planned economy, but they do take, I don't know, enormous taxes uh, on labor and stuff like that, and they pretty much choose who gets what. So, I mean... All right. Well, um, I, I don't know a lot about the kibbutz, um, except my understanding is that, that uh, first of all, I mean, socialism is certainly much more tenable in smaller numbers. My household runs as a socialist enterprise. We don't have prices. I don't charge my wife for her food and, and things like that. Um, and thankfully, she doesn't charge me for the laundry services and so on. And in fact, even large business enterprises internally work as socialist enterprises. My university doesn't charge me for when I need a pencil or a pen or a piece of paper. Um, so, you know, at, with small enough numbers where you've got groups in that, members of that group with a, a similarly aligned uh, objective, you can get along without market prices and market exchange quite reasonably well. Not without some conflict. The, I think Israeli kibbutzim are quite famous for their long-winded debates about minor issues. So um, Michael Harrington, the great American socialist, used to, used to say the biggest problem with socialism was the long meetings. And so, you know, so when you've got small numbers of people who are, who are focused on a similar objective, you know, planning and voting, you know, works reasonably well. It's just that the real world we live in is a world of large numbers filled with people with very diverse objectives. And that's where the central planning model really, really struggles. Uh, and also, again, over time, as you've, you know, that, that the more centrally planned uh, kibbutzim have really not survived. They've had to rebrand re re themselves um, more like, you know, commercial enterprises. So, again, I don't know much about the details of that. but. How about if I go to you and maybe I can move to the other part if there's... Uh, does, does political freedom also reflect the amount of autonomy that the parliament member has to perform his uh, reforms, ideology, because usually politicians sometimes know what's good for the market, but they got some pressure groups behind them that uh, prefer them to do the other. Yeah, uh, this, this gets into, I think, what we, we sometimes call public choice analysis. I mean, uh, uh, Political freedom, as I'm using it here, primarily is referring to the, the freedom of voters to select their leaders uh, and speak their mind, newspapers, speeches, things of that sort. Um, the second question is, if you have a operating political democracy, can that political democracy, is, it, is that political democracy going to support economic freedom or not? There's some evidence that it does, it, it can do both. Uh, and um, there's a lot of reasons that we know about that political democracy, political freedom will fight against, interest group politics will fight against economic freedom and so on. That maybe goes a little bit to why I think the two are separable. Um, I think that's also, there's a lot of ideas there. I think it's also an area that, that we should do more research on. Um, Jim Gortney, my, my mentor, has a number of papers with other students. And his basic argument is that if you want to reform towards economic liberalism, it's easier to do that in a democracy, especially a new democracy. Uh, but that long-run democracies tend to go backwards. So there's like a, like a, like a, like one of these. You know, early democracies give you more economic freedom, but old democracies give you less. That's kind of a a working thesis that he has. But really, he's he's doing what I do. He attacks that from an empirical point of view. And to be fair, we still only have 30 or 40 years worth of good data here. I think. Uh, when I'm retiring and you guys are my age and there's new Bob Lawson's out there and you'll have 1,600 dots instead of 800, a lot of these, um, these questions, I think, will become more empirically, uh, we'll be able to answer them more, more readily empirically. Yeah. Uh, just two quick questions. The, uh, the high-free green model is, is there a time period, even though there's not a lot of data points, based on and you saw research you've done, and others have done, where you assume they were right for what they stated? No, I think Friedman was wrong from day one. I mean, Friedman knew about India. I mean, the day he wrote that, 1962, India was a working democracy with a Soviet-like economy. I mean, the day he wrote that, I think he should have, again, he should have written something a little softer. <laughs> you know, he should have written what I said he should have written, which is, uh, it's really hard to do this. Um, and I, I think it was a little bit, uh, again, people write books, they write with a rhetorical flourish sometimes, you know, and it's very, that, that, that passage is one of the most quoted parts of the book because it's such a, 
it's such a beautiful sort of claim. Um, and I think the day you wrote it, though, it wasn't obviously true. Are there any countries that were the 30 to 40 years made of a big segment of time sit in the second quadrant? The upper left? No. Not a single one. Only 20 years. I, I, think, I think there was one 15-year period, and then everything else was no more than 10. They were out in for 10, and then they went somewhere else. They got off the, off the path. Yes, sir. Uh, again, again, where are the Scandinavian countries? Oh, they're, they're, all, they're all on the upper right. I mean, they are so. Cool. Yeah, I mean, you guys think so, Sweden's not a socialist country? Sweden is 30th. They're higher ranked than Israel. Sweden's way up here. They got good democracy. And, no, okay, they're not the highest economic freedom place on the planet, but they're they're way up here. Swedish people, they have high taxes, but other than that, what happens in Sweden every day? People get up in the morning in their private homes, they get in their Volvos, they drive to work at a private company. They go to grocery stores and they buy food in unregulated food markets. Fundamentally, Sweden is a market economy. It's not, it has high taxes at the end of the day, and they have some public, a lot more public services as a result. But structurally speaking, you went to good, Venezuela is socialism, right? So I think one of, the, one of the things we learned about the index is that we throw this word socialism around really liberally. Yeah, this is social, social, socialist. Uh, we got to be a little bit cleaner here. Uh, Sweden, if you look at all the data, regulations in Sweden are very often lighter than the United States, except for labor markets. Uh, taxes are, okay, they're 30% higher. But other than that, I, I would, I should argue Sweden's more free market than the United States except for taxes. Yeah, they're everything. Uh, well, they're not everything, actually. I don't think they are. Uh, so anyway, in terms of the data, Sweden, all the other European countries, Social, so called social democracy. So they're all high economic freedom, relatively high economic freedom. They're above the they're horizontal and they're to the right drives of democracy. So they're, they're nowhere even close to, to, to this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, just something very theoretical. This occurred to me in the same thought. You know, you're going to be listening to this, but um, we are. Uh, 
So one proposed solution, that Stephen Douglas, in the Kansas Nebraska, which was that every state would just vote. Yeah. And he claimed that this would be American life. Yeah. That every, you know, for every new territory coming in as a new American state, they would just simply have to vote whether they would have slavery. And he thought that this was yeah, and if people voted for slavery, then it must be okay. No, I see that's a, that's a conception I think is is at odds with the proper. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I think Lincoln is in the old tradition, and these Douglas would be in the new tradition where anything democracies choose is okay because we chose it. And I, I reject that as a matter of category. I categorically reject that. Democracies may give us policies that are consistent with economic freedom. They may give us policies that are inconsistent with economic freedom. They may enslave you. They may free you. But there's nothing about democracy as such. It's just a way of making decisions. That decision may be a freedom-enhancing decision or freedom, you know, so. so I, right. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, I'm, I'm completely neutral with, on, on democracy as an institution. To me, it's an institution to make collective choices. When those collective choices are uh, good, then they're good. When they're bad, they're bad. There's nothing definitionally good about a decision that's made by a group of people. By the way, that's true of individuals. If you make an individual choice, it may be a good choice, it may be a bad choice. So uh, to me, that, that you, it's, a, it's a big mistake to identify everything democracies do by definition to be therefore good. And that's a modern tendency that people, people have. And I think that's unfortunate. All right, uh, do you, I, was, I, I would like to do the next part, but I mean, if, if I don't wanna. Okay. All right. This is a small thing, and I, but I, I, this, this is going to be more fun for me. Um, does anybody know who, the, who this lady is? That's great. That's wonderful. I'm so happy. Uh, oh, I'm, so, I'm very happy that you don't know who she is, and I'm, I'm actually, maybe I should not talk about her because I don't want you to go read her books, because I think she's kind of crazy. <laughs> and I mean that in the clinical sense, like she might be insane. Um, her name is Naomi Klein. She's a far left-wing American polemist. I, I don't even think she's really I, could be qualified as an academic. She's certainly not a university professor. Not that you have to be a university professor to be an academic, but uh, she's a very popular on the on the far left American uh, political scene. She gives lots of speeches at campuses around the country. Commands much higher speaking fees than I command, and, and so on. And uh, she wrote a book called *The Shock Doctrine*. In the, and I wrote a paper about it in *Business and Politics* with a guy named Art Cardin. And in that book, the short story is she wrote this whole book, and she basically claims that neoliberalism, which is a term you notice we don't use, but they, the left uses, market capitalism, she says, is built on a bedrock of human rights violations. Um, she, well, yeah, she's a Marx. Um, and I'm like, wow. Wow, you mean, you mean people, me, Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, Bob Lawson, you mean I support a system of capitalism and free markets and it's built on human rights violation? This is an extraordinarily serious accusation. It's why, I mean, seriously, if I go to my, if, if I go to my grave and someone says, Lawson, I have news, You've, your whole career was based on human rights violation, torture. I, w I will be a sad, I'll, I'll die a sad man. I mean, I, this is a serious thing. If economic freedom is built on torture and violence, I don't want any part of it. Okay, so she's saying it is. And uh, I, don't, I can't give you all the proof, but it, she uses Chile as her exhibit A. Chile. Of course, Chile's liberalization in the 19, um, late 80s, 90s was under uh, Augusto Pinochet. Pinochet. Like, well, no, but the liberalization was, was more late, but you know, yeah, yeah. The, the real economic liberalization began to occur really in the 80s. And she, uh, I'll just give you some example. This is her, her index of the book. This is under Pinochet, advised by Friedman as economy worsens. That's interesting. This is under Friedman. She has an obsession with Milton Friedman. You see, Pinochet gets a, get, but this is Milton Friedman here, all these pages. And then that citation, that's, this is all, all of this is her Milton Friedman stuff. She's, uh, she, the whole book is about how Milton Friedman and people like Milton Friedman support human rights violations. And the one I really like is his responsibility for human rights violations 
suggested. 122, 144 to 6, 240, 346. Throughout the book, woven throughout the book, is a claim that Milton Friedman, winner of the Nobel Prize and personal friend and hero of mine, uh, is responsible for human rights violations. I'm like, wow. Now, let's look at the case she studies. Chile. You know what? Pinochet, in fact, was responsible for human rights violations. There's a very poignant uh, 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 monument in Santiago with some 2,500 names of the people who disappeared under Pinochet, people who were killed by Pinochet. Uh, he was a very, very bad person. Um, and in fact is responsible, clearly responsible for human rights violations. Torture, murder, a bad man. It's also in fact true that under Pinochet, the economy liberalized. He turned the economic system over to some Chicago trained economists. Being Chicago trained economists, they cut taxes, stabilized the monetary system, opened the trade, privatized Social Security, and economically free freedom in Chile grew. And Chile is currently ranked 13th on our economic freedom index. So we have two things. Chile had human rights violations and they liberalized. Therefore, human rights violations and, and economic liberalization are peas in a pod, right? Right? Okay, folks, how many data points did I just talk about? Actually, I think it's one data point, Chile. Um, you know what? I got data on everybody, so I ran a regression. Let's not worry about that. I, went, I gathered some data on human rights violations. There's a group called Siri in Memphis, Tennessee, of all places. <laughs> Singrinelli and Richards, they created an index of human rights, which they, very, very, uh, not very modest people, they actually named it the CIRI, which is Singrinelli and Richards, you'll see. Uh, I was wondering why we didn't name our index like the Gortney Lawson Index. But anyway, they, they named their index after themselves. It's a human rights index. It's got a lot of data, 195 countries, data all the way back to the 1980s, pretty much the period we're interested in here. Uh, long story short, I ran, some, I ran the numbers. And I said, well, look, are the countries that liberalize, do they have more torture? Naomi Klein says countries are liberalizing. They're doing it on the backs of murder and torture. Literally, she uses the word torture. If she's right, all the numbers you see should be negative. All the numbers I've got here should be negative numbers. If she's right. If she's wrong, they should be positive numbers. Yep, she's wrong. All right. She's really wrong. There's the one on torture. She's wrong. In fact, if you look at countries that have liberalized their economies, countries like Israel who have liberalized their economies, countries like Estonia that have liberalized their economy, Republic of Georgia, if you look at all the hundred or so, how many countries? Uh, that's, it's a panel, so it's, 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 um, it's about 100 countries over six uh, time periods. If you look at all the data we have, countries that liberalize tended to have less human rights violations, less torture, less murder, less disappearances. Um, and I, 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 uh, um, I, 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 this only takes five minutes. It's such a simple paper. It's one of the simplest papers I've ever written. Some crazy person says something. She says economic freedom, liberalization happens with torture and murder and disappearance. And I'm like, I wonder if that's true. It's not true. So the, the, the first story was when people make claims, we should check them. The second part of the story, the corollary is don't let crazy people get away with saying crazy things. What she's saying is literally, literally crazy. She has exactly one. I've got. Dozens and dozens. There's four dozen countries in the, in the world that have liberalized a lot. She has one example with a lot of torture and 30, 40 other examples with no torture. In fact, better human rights. So use numbers when you can to check people on their claims. Yeah, just going back to this morning's um, uh, lecture, if we, if we took historical precedent, not data, and we just looked at the Chile, uh, Case. Was there a correlation uh, in Chile between liberalizing the economy and more torture? I'm just no, talking. no, it really wasn't. I mean, in, in the practical terms, um, the you know, it, no. I mean, th there's no there's no connection that I can I know about. Uh, last year you had Jose Piñera here, all right, one of the Chicago economists. Uh, there's no connection that I know about. In other words, Pinochet wasn't murdering and killing and abducting people so that they could liberalize the economy. He was murdering and killing and abducting people because he wanted to maintain power and they were opponents of his, but it wasn't connected to the liberalization. I mean, there was no, 
You know, if, yeah, if, if he was like, oh, those guys are against our tariff plan, we need to kill them, then that would be a direct linkage. But to my knowledge, that's, that's not the case. The people that were, were, were being abducted and murdered and so on were just random opponents. Uh, they probably were not in favor of the liberalization, but that wasn't, and there's no real evidence that I've seen that that's the case. Uh, and if it was, that'd be, that'd be a serious indictment. I mean, I think that would be, that would be a, it would be a, a, put a serious shadow over the, what otherwise is a successful, successful experience. Sure. Um, so, so I, I agree. I mean, Fried, Friedman, uh, he didn't say that um, Larkin on the Friedman meant, meant uh, more political rights. Exactly. He, said, he said the opposite. He said, he said, well, he said it's a necessary condition. Right. One way yeah. or the other. Yeah. But, um, I mean, just based on what I studied in, in, in high school about, like, Soviet history, there, there seems to be a correlation between uh, people wanting to make major financial reforms, whether they're, you know, liberalizing the economy or centralizing it, and being kind of blind to individuals' uh, suffering. Oh. So when you want to, like, Collectivize everything. You do whatever you feel. Like yeah, you're yeah. a dictator, and I, I, would it be? Can you assume that? When well, you that's basically what these are saying. I mean, the flip side of the argument would be what? I mean, again, negative signs mean she's right. Positive sign means the reverse is true. In other words, that that the correlation is, you know, the opposite. So yeah, what you're yeah, saying is actually kind of If you're, if you're liberalizing an economy, you're at least going to be temporarily blind to a lot of people losing their job uh, and yeah, being uh, very poor for uh, a whole bunch of years. Yeah. So. Well, you know, uh, I, I will say that there are some economically liberal people, uh, liberalizers, who are a little bit tone deaf to the transition costs associated with liberalization. I'll admit that, and I think that's that's more of a marketing problem than it is a uh, anything else. I, I'm, I'm literally not aware of any market reformers around the world who are even tacitly uh, supporting, you know, the kinds of human rights abuses that she's talking about. Again, she's not saying they just were tone deaf to the to the difficulty of workers who are displaced because of foreign competition. She's saying that they actively were supporting. So, so I, I, I take your point, but uh, she's, she's making a point that's far, far beyond that, that I, I thought was worth rebutting. Um, there were a lot of negative criticisms of her book, but most of them were just verbal criticisms. And as far as I know, I'm one of the few people who said, you know, let's look at the numbers, because the numbers are really quite strongly uh, in, in an opposite direction from her claim. Well, it's essentially, it's what I mean. You're doing it's correlation, so you're really doing it both ways. Um, here, I mean, countries that basically this is saying countries that liberalized had better human rights, and then the reverse would also be true if you had if you didn't liberalize, or if you went down, you would have had worse. I mean, that would be the correlation. So I think it's the same. So um, I want to show one slide, and then we'll be open for total conversation. Um, this is just. Since, since I brought up Chile, has anybody ever seen this photo? What does it look like? It looks like Star Trek, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, uh, in fact, this is not a, a movie set. This is a real room that uh, the Marxist elected president of, of, um, of Chile, Salvador Allende, this is, the, this is the room that he built from which he planned to centrally plan the Chilean economy. So when we talk about central planning, it's really more of a metaphor. You know, we don't actually mean there's somebody, you know, behind the curtain pulling levers or pushing buttons running the economy. But Salvador Allende actually thought, had, had it wasn't a metaphorical central plane. He literally built a room in Santiago, Chile. And it was, this is, by the way, it wasn't functional. It's 1972. They didn't have any computers that really worked. I mean, so this was his mock up. This was, they built the room, and it was from this room that they were planning to outfit it. Now, of course, the economy fell into an immediate tailspin as soon as he took over. The union started striking, inflation went off, and pretty soon uh, Pinochet's coup killed him. Uh, so this never became operational. The only thing it actually was used for was they did use telex machines, early fax type machines, to send out orders to the army to go squash union uh, uh, protests. So it was only used for that one purpose. But anyway, uh, I always love this picture because um, uh, you know, Salvador Allende was in fact a, a you know a communist with a capital C, and and he, to him the central planning that he planned to to bring to to Chile uh, was the real deal. I mean, this is the thing. Actually, it's terribly unfortunate the Pinochet government um, uh, destroyed the room, so all we have is photos. I think someone should recreate this room. I want my living room to look like this. I think it'd be kind of fun, but it's. Uh, it's, it's really a, a fantastic story. And so the, the second thing, I mean, this is, this is maybe just off the topic, but 
it is actually a valid question to ask. Had Allende uh, survived, had there not been a Pinochet a general's coup, um, and that room became functional and they began to ran, run the central the economy, what would Chile look like today? And how many people would be dead today that otherwise would be uh, otherwise be alive? I mean, it's, it's a really empirical question. It's a what if. You can't answer it. You can't run regressions to answer that question. But everywhere else in the world where they've tried to do that right there, it hasn't ended well either. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, so anyway, that's a, just a fantastical picture. It, you know, you couldn't make that up if, if you really wanted to. All right. That's really all I have in terms of formal presentation. And uh, we can go back to the original topic or continue on Chile or anything you'd like to talk about for the remaining 15 or so minutes, I think. Okay. The regression analysis you did just said to check the explain to someone. The numbers you got, well, is it significant or is it Oh, yeah, they're all statistically significant. I mean, I never believe anyone's one regression. I don't believe my own one regression. It's half the time. But, but I'm, I'm, I would take a $1,000 straight up bet. I'll give you long odds. I'll give you a 10 to 1 odd bet. I mean, that you, you're not going to be able to flip those results uh, because it's just not there. I mean, you know, I mean, some things are just not there. Um, um, so, yeah, they're, they're, all the little stars indicate its statistical significance in a statistical sense. And you could quibble with our model. We might have done it wrong. There might be other ways to do it, to test it in a different way. But, but uh, those results are sufficiently strong. And just eyeballing the numbers, you, you're like, you did, I knew going in she was going to be wrong because you just know from looking at the countries that have liberalized, except for Chile, there really isn't a lot of disappearances and murder and torture associated with it. So. Uh, the numbers confirm that, but it's nice to confirm it, though, and that's that's kind of the lesson. Uh, I tell you that she she uses other examples, but um, the Chile is Exhibit A. Um, you know, the other examples would be mild. Well, they liberalized in this country and they ignored the unions. Like, well, yeah, that's kind of necessary if you're going to try to liberalize the economy. So she would consider that to be a human rights violation, perhaps, but. So I, I really lasered in on the thing. And the thing she talks about in the speeches she gives, it's Milton Friedman, Pinochet. Milton Friedman, Pinochet, liberalism, Pinochet, dead people. That's the, that is the, the stump speech that she gives. So, yeah. what, what about the, the like, bottom right box, like the place like Singapore and Hong Kong, which, um, so they're, they, they're, uh, they're not politically free, yeah. but they become more and more. I know about Hong Kong. Singapore became a lot more. Singapore has the same image. You spit gun on the floor, you go to jail, but you're really economically free. So, would, would we see, a, as these places liberalize aggressively without giving people rights, would you be able to show whether there was more incarceration and right. you know, stuff like that? Yeah. Well, um, the, the question's about the bottom right. Uh, there are countries in that bottom right, Hong Kong, Singapore. There are countries in time periods in the past that were in that bottom right. Taiwan and South Korea would be good examples. Taiwan and South Korea during the 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, were uh, general-run uh, military dictatorships, essentially. It wasn't really one dictator, but it was a committee of generals. The army was pretty much in charge in both Taiwan and South Korea. And yet, to a fairly high degree, they pretty much opened up the markets to international competition. We all know Taiwan and South Korea are considered market economies. What happened in both of those countries is, is that sort of disconnect became very noticeable to a lot of people. That, well, of course, what's happening in Taiwan and in South Korea in the 80s and is they're getting rich. You know, the economy is growing very nicely. That's what happens when you have liberal economies. The economy tends to grow. People get richer. And all of a sudden, they're rich people are like, hey, um, that's weird. Everywhere else in the world where people are rich, they get to vote on their, their leaders and they get to say what they want and tell whatever jokes they want and write our articles. And so all the students like you guys rushed out into Seoul and, and, and Taipei and there were huge student protests. Uh, and eventually the general said, okay, yeah, sure. We, you know, now they got democracies, they got crazy democracies. You know, Taiwan's parliament is like, like they have fist fights all the time and things. So, so there we have a very nice story that, well, maybe those guys down in the bottom right, maybe that's not an equilibrium. And everywhere that's moved out of that has gone pretty much up to the top right. They've basically liberalized their, their democracy to co coincide with their liberal market. Um, having said that, Hong Kong and Singapore haven't done that. Uh, Singapore has the opportunity to do that. They're an autonomous country. They, they, the, the, the authoritarian government there, which, again, it's not totalitarian. It's not... It's not that bad. I mean, yeah, gum on the sidewalk, don't, don't smoke pot. But, but it's not like it's, it's, you know, there's not secret police. There's no gulag, you know, anything like that. 
Um, so, so, but, but Singapore uh, could liberalize its democracy. They, I don't see any students hitting the streets in Singapore, though. I don't see, there's not a lot of evidence that I've been able to discern from my faraway site seat that says the Singaporean people are terribly upset or agitate, agitated about their lack of political democracy and civil liberties. So, um, and it's been a quite a long time period now, and they're quite rich now in, in Singapore, so I, I don't know. Uh, Hong Kong is a little bit different because uh, obviously it was one thing but with the British, but now uh, the cost of taking on China are very high and agitating against China might, be, might not be the wisest political calculation to make. But um, there isn't, I mean, there are, you know, we saw unrest in, in Hong Kong. There were student protests in Hong Kong. There is some attempt on the part of uh, Hong Kong uh, people to uh, move towards more political democracy. Uh, the local Hong Kong government has met them, I was gonna say halfway, but it's like one-tenth of the way. They've made some, some moves in that direction, but not very far, mostly because Beijing won't have it. Uh, so that might be an issue in the future. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that I don't think we have a very well-developed theory for the bottom right, right quadrant we saw some countries move to the top right from the bottom right. Uh, we see several countries, a couple countries, and the oil-rich countries also, they sort of seem to be quite stable, Arab Springs notwithstanding. Um, I don't think we have a well-developed theory. Like, Friedman and, and, and Hayek gave us a pretty well-developed theory of the upper left. No one, at least to my knowledge, has really tried to analytically parse out what's the analytical likely scenarios, what are the political tensions that would, and, and therefore I don't have a, a clean empirical test that I could go after. I am watching those, those numbers. Um, I would love to be able to say, oh, that's not stable. Everybody will go up north, up to that top right. That's the happy place. But I don't, it doesn't obviously seem to be the case. So, you know, it's the Arab Spring happened in the places where in the bottom left, not the top, the bottom right. I mean, the Arab Spring was most prominent in the places that were politically unfree and economically unfree, places like Libya, Tunisia, and so on. Um, it didn't really t do much in Dubai and Oman even or Kuwait and those are the places that are politically unfree but economically free relatively speaking. So, all right. <laughs> <laughs>